Welcome. We are back with another edition of Poetry Rocks the District. At this ninth fabulous, phenomenal, culminating uh, workshop interview series, I am so excited to have with me Dr. Jennifer James. Dr. Jennifer James specializes in African-American literature and culture with a concentration in the 19th century. Dr. James has a particular interest in theorizing the relationships among literary praxis, representations of blackness and socio-political violence. Professor James is working on two projects, Black Jack, Andrew Jackson, and African American Cultural Memory, which traces the history of three generations of ancestors enslaved by the president, and a cultural history of a little known labor riot staged by Black American miners during the Nadir. And, uh, this semester, you will probably see Dr. Jennifer James at George Washington University inspiring her students. Uh, please help me welcome the phenomenal, uh, inspiring activist, scholar extraordinaire, Dr. Jennifer James. Dr. Jennifer James, I am so excited that you are here as our special guest on behalf of Humanities DC and Day 8. Um, I know you personally because you're a former board member of Split This Rock, and I've seen how your passion for uh, political poetry and your activism um, intersect. Um, you're also uh, an educator. so I. Before we dive into uh, Phyllis Wheatley, I just wanted to ask you how your teaching and activism intersect. Well, that is a great question, and I'm so glad that you asked it. Um, you know, just last semester, last year, when we were online, I devised a course called Black Women Writers and the Black Lives Matter Movement. And in that class, we looked at Black women who were thinking about and mulling over the situation with police brutality, Black imprisonment, you know, in mm -hmm. the United States. So we read poets like Damaris Hill, who wrote A Bound Woman is a Dangerous Thing, which was about mm -hmm. Black women in imprisonment. We read Claudia Rankine, a Citizen, obviously, um, you know, one of, I think, the greatest poets who takes on that issue of Blackness and violence and identity. And so we read, you know, even more writers in that. And that dovetails with my own interest in um, mass incarceration in the abolitionist movement. I was, I was a founder of a Critical Resistance DC uh, with Zane El Amin and Linda Cameron, both of whom are poets. And so um, I thought it was pretty profound that people who were writers were also very, very interested in this issue that is affecting so many Black people, not just in DC, but across the nation and in the world. As Zane, who um, was a poet who co-organized it with me, was a political prisoner outside of the United States. And mm -hmm. so that was his interest. And so for us to come together, someone who's a Black American, someone who was an immigrant from Lebanon, um, a Black woman from the South, Linda Cameron, um, there was a lot of energy um, in that um, founding. And it connected to our identities as writers. They're poets. I was a scholar. I used to be a poet. And so um, I think it's a natural combination. Well, terrific. And, and uh, going back to poets, mm -hmm. uh, we've been looking at, from the start of this series, the turbulence of the insurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, we addressed that and looking at America and what has evolved over the last nine months has been uh, an unraveling of uh, inequalities on so many levels. I uh, wanted, I thought it was important as we wrap up this series to go back to the first 
African-American published poet, Phyllis Wheatley, mm -hmm. who uh, is extraordinary. And a lot of folks do not know about Phyllis Wheatley's um, impact. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important to really look at how this young African-American slave was taught to read and write and astounded, not just uh, Americans, but just around the world, showing that I can write poems, but not only did she write poems, her poems were coded um, and uh, she was able to write and say as much as she could <laughs> um, using a brilliant language that had so many metaphors and images that have so many um, twists and turns. And so I'm hoping that you could, maybe we could look at some of um, her poems and uh, get inspired. You know, we have a lot of young people that are watching this series and I don't think they know that you're never too young to write a poem and you know, I even forget. Never that. too young. Absolutely. And <laughs> she was eight years old when she was brought on a slave ship to the United States. And she was bought as a maidservant to a woman um, who was married to a royalist, somebody who was um, interested in keeping America colonized by the British. And but they taught her to read and write. She was very sickly, so they didn't make her do a lot of work. And it was in that position of being tutored by these uh, by this family that her genius came out. Um, and I think it's really important to um, emphasize that even under these conditions, she was enslaved, even though she had slave owners who might have encouraged her, who might have been a little more delicate with her, she still didn't have her freedom. And her imagination became a vehicle for her freedom. Mm -hmm. And she could say things about her condition and her situation that she couldn't articulate directly. And I think that that's one of the things that's most important to remember about her. She was captive, but her mind was not captive. Um, and she dedicates a whole poem that we're not going to talk about to her imagination. And she implies that that was the only time she really felt free, when she felt unchained, was when she was writing poetry. Mm. Wow. Um, I do not have an extensive knowledge of all of Phyllis Wheatley's poems. I do know um, the one of her famous I mean, poems. Yeah. Yes. I'm being brought from Africa to America. Yeah. That is her most, um, I think, well-known poem. It's in a lot of anthologies, and it's the poem that introduces Phyllis Wheatley to a lot of readers. And it's a controversial poem because on the surface, it seems like she is expressing a kind of gratitude for being enslaved and that she's calling her fellow Africans pagans. Um, so you have to look at it closely in order to derive, I think, other meanings, layers, um, the codes, as you said, that are in this poem. Um, and so I'm hoping we can do a little bit about of that and then talk about um, the way that in some ways she got rejected generations after she wrote this poem because people couldn't see what the subtext was. They were just looking at the surface of the poem. So let's read it. Um, I'm being brought from Africa to America. And this was 1773 when she published this poem and she wrote it when she was 18 or 19. Hmm. Um, Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God, that there's a savior too. Once I redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolic dye. Remember Christians, Negroes, black as cane, 
may be refined and join the angelic train. So you can wow. see how that is, no, it's a beautiful poem. Uh, but you can see how that would be misread again and again and again. Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land. Oh my gosh, Phyllis, what are you saying? And so critics generations afterwards wanted to almost forget that she existed. And so she was recovered later when people decided to look at the wider, the, the breadth of her poetry and not just focus on this one and then try to figure out what this one might say when looking at other poems in which she does talk about slavery more directly and her distress about slavery. So um, in this one, yeah, you, you're nodding. So can we talk about it? Yeah, I was just thinking of the language, um, you know, sable race. Yeah. And I'm just, I'm, I just amazed at how this poem is centuries and centuries old, but it's still, it still holds up. And I, a child of Filipino immigrants, um, it is such an American poem as, as we have all been here or immigrated or, you know, found mm -hmm. space. So I, I it right. resonates with me in, in so many, in so many levels. Right. And if we, if we look at it closely, we can see that she's not saying that she's really benighted or black as Cain. She is um, expressing the views that some people have of her. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. And then in quotation marks, their color is a diabolic dye. So she's mobilizing this discourse of blackness and evil and denigration and pagan to show us that she understands how white people view her. She gets it. She gets it. Um, but then she goes on to say that black people can still be, quote unquote, refined and join the angelic train. And what she means is that they can be thought of as children of God that they can also be on their way to heaven, which is important because in that time, in some veins of Christianity, they, you know, thought that Black people couldn't be accepted, right, into, into heaven, that they were doomed right. to hell, that they, uh, right, because of predestination, they, they were just destined to not be among um, God's favored people. And so for her to say that, yes, we can be, was something that was extraordinary. And she's also speaking the language of the dominant culture. This was a Christian land. And so she's speaking to them in terms that they will understand. So yeah. I'm, she's saying, I'm Christian like you. And, you know, at the time, there, there was the belief, you know, that, it, that was circulating that if you were a Christian, you could not be enslaved. And right. so slave owners were, you know, well, what does this mean? Well, you know, we want our slaves to convert to Christianity, but does that mean we'll have to free them? Um, and so there was a lot of like stress and drama around the Christianization of slaves. And so she's saying, I'm a Christian, I'm one of you. Maybe I should have my freedom. That's also in this. You know, she was 18 years old. She would have been on the DC Youth Slam team with this she poem. Would have been. <laughs> she would have been on the Slam team. And you know what? And she would have won. Yes. <laughs> she would have yes. won. And, and she was so powerful. I mean, this is how powerful she was. You know, we might look at this poem and think, oh my gosh, what she's saying. You know, a lot of my students, a lot of like young readers think, oh my gosh, we don't, we don't like that she's saying mercy brought her here. Well, first of all, we need to know that she's saying that God spared me. If you think about what the middle passage was, how dangerous it was, how difficult it was, people mm -hmm. suffocated, people died, they threw themselves overboard um, because they didn't want to become enslaved. They didn't know what was happening to her. She was a sickly eight-year-old child and she survived. And she's saying that was God's mercy. Mm -hmm. Not that it was mercy that I was brought, that I became a slave. It's mercy that I was spared because so many of my, you know, sisters and brothers were not. They were not spared. Um, but she was so powerful um, that Thomas Jefferson, about 15 years later, wrote about her in one of his most famous works. And he said, oh, 
you know, everybody's reading Phyllis Wheatley, you know, somebody, you know, uh, showed me Phyllis Wheatley. And as you said, she was being read around the world Mm -hmm. and she was being um, held up as an argument about why black people should not be enslaved. Let's look, look at this genius. How can we enslave people who can create this kind of genius? Mm -hmm. Thomas Jefferson wrote down that, oh, you know, she writes about religion, that's fine, but she's not really a poet. She doesn't have imagination. You know, she's just parroting you know, what other people do. Um, he was afraid of her. He was afraid of her mind. He was afraid of her art because that meant that maybe what he was doing, which was being an enslaver was absolutely wrong because, oh my gosh, they're human. And not only are they human, maybe they're brilliant humans. Yeah, not that brilliance should matter, right? You're human, it doesn't matter, right? But it caused a lot of conflict in him. And so he had to put down on paper how much he just thought she was terrible and everybody was wrong in, in praising her. That's how powerful she was. And also the, the second female American author, uh, poet to be published, and Brad Street was the first, and then it's Phyllis Wheatley. Right, and um, she was the first <laughs> black person to publish a book of poems, right. Um, and you know, today we, we can publish, we can make our books happen, but to publish in that time, uh, publishers had to really invest. It, well, it wasn't it, easy. Books were not easy. It wasn't easy. Her mistress, the person who owned her, tried to get her book, book published in uh, the United States. Um, and the way that it would have gotten published is if her mistress could have found enough people to subscribe to it. They called it subscription. So you needed 300 people to subscribe and then she would get it published. She couldn't find 300 people in the colonies. So she took Phyllis. She and Phyllis went to London. And it was in London that they said, yes, I will publish. We will publish this book. You so she what? went through extraordinary lengths and she was determined. She was determined. She really wanted to see her book published. It was a different, um, you know, the British are, you know, they can be very, very racist. But at the time, they were already seriously debating the end of slavery. And they ended up ending slavery before we did. So there was already this robust abolitionist movement in Britain, and there wasn't in the United States. And so she was received, I think, on more equal terms, not equal terms, but more equal terms than she was in the United States. They, you know, people saw her as a threat. You know who didn't see her as a threat? Who? George Washington. Why? Because in, in 1775, she wrote a poem about him, and she sent it to him. <laughs> she wrote this poem about George Washington, about like how excited she was that he was named the general of the, like the head, I can't remember, she calls it the General Lee Samoa, but he was like the head of the Continental Army. And the reason she was excited about the revolution is she thought, oh, freedom is coming for the, the colonists. Well, maybe freedom will also come for Black people. Uh, there's a spirit of freedom in the air. So she was very excited. She wrote this long poem about him and he read it and he wrote her back. And he said, oh, wow, you know, you make me look pretty good. I, I like this poem. Um, can you come see me? Can you come see me? And so she traveled to his headquarters. And this is like during, you know, the tumult of, you know, building to war during war. I can't remember the exact uh, dates. I'm not that great with history. And she went to go see him. Um, and so she had all of these encounters with really famous colonists, including, you know, George Washington and John Hancock, attest, you know, attested to the fact that, you know, she uh, could write the poems. You know that she, people didn't believe that she could write the poems that she wrote. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe it. And so they had to assemble a group of men who were colonists who had gone to Harvard, you know, some of the men who would write the, you know, ciders of the Declaration of Independence eventually to say, we believe that she could write this poem. We, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know? And so they might have like talked to her about the Latin that she uses, about the biblical references, you know, mm -hmm. they might have made her write in front of them, but they said, Yes, we believe that this young slave girl 
who just came from Africa a few years ago could actually do this? We've, we've got to sort of segue um, into Phyllis Wheatley and then to now. And um, during this time in DC, we have lost a phenomenal poet, Venus Thrash, who has inspired um, not just the DC literary and also in the uh, activist and political spheres, Venus Thrash has inspired um, a whole generation of poets as a member of Cave Canem, uh, the, the sudden uh, news of Venus's death um, just really galvanized a lot of writers to really look at, at her work. I would say that it was an honor to curate Venus Thrash who performed at Split This Rocks uh, Festival. Uh, Venus was not only the activist, we were performing together at uh, the Mayor's Queer Pride Show at Lincoln Theater. I think that was the last time um, we had performed together. And she would just, so unassuming, quiet, soft-spoken, but on stage, um, the musicality of the work um, would just take flight. Um, just this, this, the, the sound, the lyricism of Venus and also uh, the points that she would try to make also as a, a queer poet as well, also inspired me. I feel, I look at Essex Temple as another DC activist poet. And then I feel like Venus Thrash uh, is another continuation of someone who is so DC. And She's so, so DC, funny. yeah. When she came from the deep South, but DC really became her home. And um, it frankly doesn't feel this, the DC poetry scene, even though it's slowed down because of COVID and we're doing things virtually, it still doesn't feel the same without her. She was so beautiful, so smart, so kind. She made people feel so loved. Um, I was saying to a couple of my friends, oh, you know, she would always flirt with me whenever <laughs> she would see me. And everybody else said, oh, she would flirt with me whenever she would see me. Oh, she would flirt with me whenever she would see with me. You know, men, women, both. She just made you feel seen and made you feel um, loved. You know, she had that, she had that ability and we loved her back, absolutely. Yeah. And also a shout out because Venus is also a, a phenomenal mom um, yeah. to her son. And I remember Venus uh, taking her son to all of the readings and um, yeah. just, just to be able to, to juggle all of that and still remain passionate and also an educator as well. So um, I love the poem that you found and I'm hoping that that you would read this piece which I think really bookends the Phyllis Wheatley poem. I, I think so too and I hope I can do it justice um, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to read this. I feel I feel really honored. Birding while black and so as we know this is it takes its reference um, to the recent incident between Amy Cooper and Michael Cooper, I believe his name was. Michael? I, I believe that was his name, um, mm -hmm. who had the police called on him because he was Black in, in the quote-unquote wrong place, uh, which was in nature, enjoying birding. And so in this poem, she imagines what it's like to be a birder. Maybe she was a birder herself. Um, and what thinking about birds does for a, for a black person. Birding wild black. I know the pigeon's bloodshot eye, smoky feathers, how it roosts along the building's edges, waddles when it walks. I know the difference between blue birds' black wingtips and blue jays' checkered tail. I know the thrashers' frantic folly when I see it. 
the cardinal's scarlet overcoat, the raven's velvety down, how the flash and flutter of wings distract from view, how the marvel of flight frees the mind from its cages, how the bird song conjures an ancient tune, calling back the oceans over which we've crossed and believing legend over which some of us flew. And uh, it's just such an incredible poem. The poem takes flight and it shows just how words can just soar in that poem. Uh, I can't think of a better way to end this series than with that poem. Thank you right. for thank you for bringing these poems. Right. Uh, and, and I think for, for me, the theme of our discussion is the flight of imagination through poetry, especially during, during one of the most difficult, unprecedented, confusing stop-go uh, moments of human civilization. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I agree. And the way that she the way the speaker imagines himself or herself or themselves as all of these colors, you know, velvety and, and blue and black. And there's something really unconfining about it. And it does, I think, connect us back to Phyllis Wheatley, particularly with that image of the ocean. You know, Phyllis crosses the ocean mm -hmm. and Venus brings us back across the ocean, you know, through flight in that last final line of the poem. And so I think that they're, they're just beautiful together. And full of hope, full of hope with Venus's um, poems. Um, and still the, the lyricism rings and you did a phenomenal reading of the poem. Um, Dr. Jennifer James, it is an honor that you're here. I wish it was in person, but... Um, Such a pleasure. Uh, this is an incredible series. Uh, again, we thank you so much. Um, I would love to dedicate um, this particular uh, episode of Poetry Rocks District to Venus Thrush.